A tribute to Johnny Palmer. Brought to you by Terre Haute First National Bank, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Regional Hospital, and Complete Outdoor Equipment and General Rentals. And tonight, we look back at the career of a local broadcasting legend, Johnny Palmer. Last month, before Johnny signed off Eyewitness News for the final time, I had the opportunity to sit down with John at his home to talk about his life in and out of broadcasting. During the next hour, we will take a look at that interview. We'll also be hearing from some of the people who have worked with John throughout the years, and we'll have a few other surprises as well. Well, I remember Johnny Palmer when he came to Terre Haute. Uh, in fact, I, after all these years, I remember where he came from, Ottumwa, Iowa. He was brought here to be the morning man of BOW, where I was working at the time, and uh, Johnny played the records, um, talked about this, that, and everything else, and I did the news. And during that period of time, from 58 to 68, Johnny became really the dominant radio personality here in the Terre Haute market. His show, his morning show, was number one year in and year out. And in many instances, it wasn't even close. So when Johnny left radio for television, uh, he was already a well-established on-the-air personality here. On the air, he, uh, he called himself the bald-headed fat man. And morning after morning, he delighted in picking on his wife, Alice. She was fat, sassy Alice. Uh, she couldn't cook. She didn't make the bed. Uh, she didn't sweep the floors, uh, this sort of thing. And, uh, whether Alice was ever embarrassed by any of these comments, I don't know, but uh, uh, she was certainly a good sport. And Johnny called a spade a spade. If, uh, if there was an office holder in town that wasn't doing the job, a lousy job, he said so. And I think the audience related to him because uh, uh, he talked about their concerns. Uh, he talked about being railroaded, about potholes in the streets, uh, uh, lack of snow removal equipment and those sorts of things. I made the mistake one afternoon of telling Johnny that uh, my wife was expecting our first child. And for nine months, he subjected the listening audience to an almost daily progress report on my wife's condition. And I remember one Thanksgiving we were working together and uh, he was uh, bemoaning the fact that uh, we were working and most people had the day off and that uh, if we were lucky, we'd get a nice turkey dinner, but probably would end up uh, with a bowl of bean soup and a bologna sandwich. And I remember the phone just rang off the hook, and I don't know how many invitations we had to Thanksgiving dinner. I don't know that we accept any of them, but we appreciated the kindness of the listeners. So Johnny and I go back a long way. He was a big part in my broadcasting career some 30 years ago. Um, I know I, for one, am going to miss Johnny not being on the air. I don't know what your future plans are, John, but I wish you well. And I just want to say thank you, my friend for a lot of memories. Well, let's start out, John. Uh, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, stuff I don't even know about you. But uh, let's go back to your very early days, talking about childhood. Can you tell us uh, where's Johnny Palmer from, and what were the early days like? Well, I was born in Iowa, of course. I was reared, you know, I guess you could say, in the western states, because no one location, because my father was a traveling engineer for the Milwaukee Railroad. Um, I always considered myself to be I guess a country boy. And uh, maybe that's one of the reasons I liked uh, and have always liked Terre Haute because uh, uh, people are friendly and it's uh, not a big city and uh, yet it's not a small country town. The things that I like to do are all available here. So um, I guess you could say I'm a country boy that uh, you know uh, grew up uh, in small communities and uh, decided I like small communities and have stayed ever since. Uh, I had a, had a very interesting uh, childhood. My father was uh, uh, rather old when he married, and so was my mother. Uh, we, my sister and I both came late in life, and uh, so I really didn't have my father around really too many years as I was growing up, but uh, uh, I could do nothing wrong as far as my father was concerned, and I tried to raise my, uh, my daughter that way that uh, she could never do anything wrong, but I was lucky. She grew up to be, I'm a little biased, a perfect young lady, and I can't say the same for myself being a perfect young gentleman. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on from the early days, I don't know if you want to comment a little bit about uh, what kind of kid Johnny Palmer was uh, growing up and in school or not, but uh, fill us in. I was just about an average student, and I, um, my conduct left much to be desired. 
Um, all the time that I was in school, I, I won't say all the time I was in school, but uh, quite often when I was in school, I was in trouble. And they always seemed like insignificant uh, little incidents to me, but uh, I guess to other people they weren't considered insignificant. So I spent uh, quite a bit of time at the principal's office. Never did get expelled. <laughs> Never did get expelled. I lucked out, so to speak. To this day. <laughs> to this day, yes. Principal Thank you. still hasn't caught up with you. Um, let's talk a bit about how you became interested in broadcasting. Uh, had you always taken a liking to it, or was it an accident? How did it all come about? Well, I, I think originally, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I, I think I wanted to be an attorney, or I wanted to be a doctor. I think those were my first two choices. But uh, just two doors uh, down the street from where we lived, uh, the gentleman owned a radio station. And um, after I came back from the military, uh, I was going to school, and I, came, I all at once became far more intelligent than any of my professors. And I decided, you know, why should I waste uh, the government's money on the GI Bill and go to school when I knew more than they did? And he offered me an opportunity to, um, I did five minutes of news on the sign-off of a uh, daytime radio station. That's how I got interested in broadcasting. I would look in at the disc jockeys and I'd say, boy, I'd love to be a disc jockey. So I made the transition from news to a disc jockey and then I worked both jobs for a while. And where was that? That was in Iowa. There's several different stations back there. All right, let's backtrack a bit. You were talking about uh, your military service. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I was in uh, the Navy Air Force and they didn't consider it the Navy Air Force. I was uh, in naval aviation, I guess is the best way to put it. And um, I got shipped overseas. I was what uh, I guess you'd call a 90-day wonder and I wonder how I ever <laughs> survived. But I, I was very fortunate. I got in at the very end of the war and uh, experienced a little bit and uh, not one of the most pleasant parts of my life, I will say that. And um, when the war ended in, uh, I was sent to the uh, Pacific. And when the war ended over there, I was uh, happy to come home. I headed up a short patrol unit in San Francisco, and I guess that was probably uh, the highlight of my military career. All right, let's go back to the broadcasting. You got your start in Iowa in radio, doing your little news minutes there. Um, coming to Terre Haute, I know that was kind of a chance thing for you. I worked for the old 3i Broadcasting Corporation that was owned by Bill O'Connor and um, I guess you could call him a broker. He would go in and buy a station that was uh, somewhat down on its luck and we would be there for a while and we'd get the ratings up and then he would find some local people to buy the radio station. And um, just before coming to Terre Haute they told me on a Monday morning the station I had been sold and had my choice of going, I think there was uh, Springfield, Illinois. Uh, Anderson, Indiana, Paducah, Kentucky, I don't know, several different stations, or Terre Haute, and I said, where's Terre Haute? And they said, you'll find it on the road map, and you're to report for work on Wednesday. So from Monday morning until Wednesday, I was madly packing my suitcase and trying to find where Terre Haute was on the map. In fact, shortly after I arrived in Terre Haute, I drove down the wrong way on Walnut Street and was stopped by police officers, and uh, I said, where is this radio station, B-O-W? And they said, it's just down the street, just about a block. That was the old bow corner at 6th and Pomper. And I walked in, and the newsman had failed to put in an appearance. So I did the newscast within probably 15 minutes after arriving in Terre Haute, and I called it Terre Haute. <laughs> and it was Terre Haute for quite some time before I adjusted to the fact that it's Terre Haute, Indiana. Hello, this is Indiana Senator Dan Coates. It's hard to imagine television news in the Wabash Valley area without Johnny Palmer. For well over 20 years at WTWO and over 10 years in Terre Haute Radio before that, Johnny's been a familiar voice and an important leader. He ends 40 years of broadcasting as a respected professional and an institution in this part of the Midwest. Johnny set a standard in Terre Haute for television excellence, and along the way he's developed a reputation as a friend and a teacher helping new reporters, taking time to work with new anchors, sharing his experience. That kind of humility and generosity is the true test of professionalism. Johnny is also showing a willingness to be involved outside the newsroom. As a veteran and member of the American Legion, as a former elk and past president of the Wabash Valley Press Club, Johnny Palmer has been an active participant in the life of his community. We wish Johnny Palmer and his wife Alice all the best during retirement 
and offer all our thanks to Johnny for decades of exceptional service. Congratulations, Johnny. A great difficulty because I had worked in markets where, you know, the common names were Smith and Palmer and uh, Everett and things like that. And um, Smoothie's Market looked like Smoothie's Market to me, and Ambrosini's looked like Ambrosini's to me, and I had a tough time adjusting. Well, you got went from the frying pan into the fire very quickly here in Terre Haute. I know you have a tremendous fondness for this area now. What were your initial impressions? I thought Terre Haute was very clannish. And uh, I, I was quite fortunate because the people that, uh, well, Court McCarg, the late Court McCarg, uh, the late Bill Roberts, and some of those people, uh, uh, they knew that I was coming as an outsider. And I wasn't totally welcome to come into this market among the people I worked with because they saw, it. I think they brought in two disc jockeys and one news person into the organization. And of course, um, like in any business, they say, well, we have a new owner and they're bringing all these new people in, we are out. Uh, but they were just fine, friendly people, and uh, it didn't take me too long to adjust to the fact that uh, Darrow really, you know, wasn't clannish. But uh, the first few days, I thought, I don't know whether I like this market. But as you can tell, I've been here since December of 1957. Uh, apparently, I like Darrow and the people. Jan, all the guys here at Wish Radio, where all the good old songs have gone, just want to say we're, we're proud and happy that you're walking out of the place on your own feet. You know what I mean? I mean, others have been rubbed out, you know, but uh, all the ownerships of the TV station, all them changes, all them people, you're walking out like a man. We're proud of you. And we also want to say, all of us in radio, that we think you made the great transformation from radio to television. I mean, you were the bald-headed fat man on radio. And you got to be the skinny guy with hair on TV. We think it's wonderful. You lost all that weight and grew all that hair. You know what I mean? We're proud of you. John, let me be serious for just half a second to say that for those of us who worked with you here in radio and Terre Haute and television and have worked uh, across the street from you, uh, you've been a great one. That's all there is to it. You've been a great one. And uh, Godspeed and good luck on whatever you decide to do in the future. People my age or younger than I am know you basically from television only, but just going out and about, uh, when we go out to cover news stories and so forth, I have people tell me all the time that they remember you back on WBOW. So obviously you had a big following way back then on radio. Um, back in those days, uh, um, it was spooky old Alice, my wife, and I, I did the morning show, of course, for 11 years. Uh, I think right up until about mid-1960, I did the morning show on Val, and I was the bald-headed fat man. I was pretty chunky, and uh, the hair was quite thin, and I didn't wear a full hair piece then like I do now, and uh, so I could legitimately get away with the fact that I was the bald-headed fat man, and my wife, spooky old Alice, would get up in the morning, and she'd fry bananas for me, you know, or she'd bake <laughs> me some jello or something like that, and people could, never could understand how spooky old Alice stuck with me all these years. But that was a fun time in radio. I enjoyed it. Um, in fact, uh, my wife and I talked about the fact that uh, uh, since I had determined that this is a good time for me to get out of television broadcasting, and um, I really didn't know whether I just wanted to retire, retire, or whether I wanted to retire from broadcasting. And she said, well, why don't you go back into radio? And boy, I've given that a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. Because I, I still think that uh, radio is your first love, mainly due to the fact if you do well, it's all because of Johnny Palmer, Mike Everett, or whatever. And in television, you know, our work depends on so many other people to make us look good, our production people, our news photographers, our reporters that are in the field. And they can make us look better, they can make us look bad. Or good. Sure can. Let's talk a bit about some of the people that you worked with back in, in the old days in radio. Quite a few familiar names from this area. Well, of course, Martin Plastic is the one that really stands out, I think, uh, among most people, uh, you know, that have been around Terre Haute, even now, because, uh, of course, Martin is uh, still in radio. Uh, he's one of my... I, I'm sorry I never had your voice or Martin Plastic's voice. Um, Bob Rouse is another one that uh, jocked with me at Bow on the old Bow Corner, and, of course, he's still in the community. And uh, those fellows always had fantastic voices. When I came into radio, the time of the great voice was starting to pass and all you had to do is be able to shout what time it was and 
and what the next top 40 song was or something like that. Uh, as long as you could read every other word, well, you could be successful in radio at that time. And of course, it's changed now. In the good old radio days, I came in just as they were passing out, so to speak. I remember Johnny Palmer as the first broadcaster I met when I came to Terre Haute to work in radio in November of 1959. Johnny at that time was doing the morning show at WBOW in the old brick building at 6th and Poplar Streets and the studio was upstairs and I remember walking in and seeing Johnny sitting there and I thought to myself I'll never be able to do what he's doing. And I remember Johnny morning after morning calling himself the old bald-headed fat man and talking about spooky old Alice and he always had a cup of coffee sitting there with him and it was a cup of coffee and burnt toast and and uh, what a tremendous following he had and uh, through the years Johnny has uh, continued to maintain that following he's done a great job he's a good guy and and Johnny I just wish you well in your retirement well you've told me some good stories about doing commercials while you were on the air and so forth uh, it's too bad that I don't have tapes of some of the commercials <laughs> that we used to do on the air uh, I, I really like radio, mainly due to the fact that uh, uh, it was freewheeling when I first came into it because it was all top 40 radio and uh, television was just starting to come into its own and it, it was a job that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was a fun job because you could just let it all hang out. On the morning show, I would go to work, hadn't shaved. And, oh, you'd sound so great, and really, you didn't feel great. I'd gone to work some mornings when I had no business going to work, and it was all a facade, because you'd sound so happy, and you were half dead. Mm -hmm. And I would normally go through, and I normally worked the 6 to 9 a.m. show, and I'd go through about three packs of cigarettes and 40 cups of coffee, so, you know, it was a good, healthy atmosphere in the control room, <laughs> truly. You did commercials for, uh, was it Champagne Velvet or some other type of? Uh, Grain Belt Beer. Grain Belt, Yeah, right. I did a Grain Belt uh, Beer commercial, and I'd pop the cap, you know, on the air, and I'd say, Grain Belt, and I can't, <laughs> I, I guess senility is setting in because I would sip my beer. By the end of that show, of course, that was not at the original station that I worked for, that was in Des Moines. Uh -huh. And uh, Anyway, by the end of my all-night show, I was normally in pretty good shape, very happy, and you know, it was, I didn't care whether I went home or not. Those days are definitely gone. <laughs> they are gone forever. <laughs> Obviously, you were very successful in, in local radio here. What prompted you to make the transition to television? I know you were talking about Martin Plastic. There's a guy who stayed right. in radio the whole time. Well, the corporation that I worked for, I guess you could say that uh, we lived out of a suitcase for a while because they'd buy a station, you know, and keep it so long and then sell it. And um, we came here in December of uh, 57, and in August of 1958, uh, Sherry was born, our daughter. And um, not too long after that, uh, the station was sold, and not too long after that, the station was sold again, and they told me that, uh, you know, I could go to wherever it was. And I had decided, you know, I've lived out of a suitcase long enough, and uh, we have a youngster that we'd like to educate. Terre Haute, um, you know, has good schools here, has a good school system. Indiana State University, she couldn't go to Rose, of course, but St. Mary of the Woods. And um, so I decided I'll just settle down. And about the time that I had turned in my resignation, Channel 2 called me and asked me, say, would you like to work on a talent basis and do sports for us? So I made the transition to television, it was just that plain and simple. Some of the folks even at work are surprised to know that you did, in fact, start out as a sports guy. Tell right. us about that. I was always interested in sports. Well, you know, when I was at uh, Bow, and even before I came to Terre Haute, I did play-by-play -play in basketball, a little bit of football, mostly color football. And uh, in fact, uh, when I first came here, Corky McCard was doing basketball and football. And I took over basketball because he was just putting, at that time, he was station manager as well as doing the play-by-play. -play. So I did play-by-play -play basketball, and then I did the color for him on football and Big Ten football and uh, we travel all over the country you know with the Hoosiers and of course we followed Indiana State in basketball. I guess of all the current news people I'm the one that goes back about the farthest with Johnny Palmer when I think of John it's not just as a co-worker but as a true friend. For many years John and I rode back and forth to work together and while we talked about work uh, some of the time we also discussed the personal things that were going on in our lives like any friends would. When John told me he was leaving TV2 I really had mixed emotions from a selfish standpoint, I didn't like it because I enjoyed working with John so much. 
But on the other hand, Johnny had been here a long time. There's always comes a point in your life where you, it's time to move on. And I guess Johnny felt he had reached that point. Johnny, from the bottom of my heart, it has been a pure pleasure working with you. I won't say goodbye because I know we'll be keeping in touch, but I will say good luck, and there's no doubt you'll be missed here at TV2. Take care, John. As I recall, the uh, management of the station decided that they needed some change in personnel. And I just happened to walk in one day and the newsroom was basically void of people. And I found out that they had terminated everyone but myself and Jim Underwood. And for a period of about seven days, I did news, weather, and part of the time I did sports until they hired a new staff. That's how the transition came. They hired, the next person they hired was a sportscaster. And so I just stayed in the news department. And uh, they asked me, you know, would you like to stay in? Uh, that was about the time that Mark Allen came out of engineering into news. And uh, from that time on, I did the early news and uh, Mark would do the late news. And then, I don't know, a year or so after that, then it became Mark Allen and Johnny Palmer. Um, my first memory of John Palmer was when I was just a kid. I used to remind him of this, that I listened to him on radio when I was in high school. And years later, I met him when I went to Channel 2. We worked together. He was doing sports initially, and then he went into news. The one thing that always struck me about John was how he was so open with everyone. He really was. People would say, what's Johnny Palmer like? He's like you see on the air, for real. Uh, young people would come into the station to start out, and it can be a terrifying business. John would always take them under his wing. He was always friendly to them. Uh, and help them along. And if you went throughout the country right now and talked to many people in this business, uh, they could tell you stories about how they started at a television station in Terre Haute, Indiana, and John Palmer had helped them. That's the truth. He has helped so many people. A lot of fond memories about John. He was never at a loss for words. He, on the air or off the air, uh, we used to have great fun together because he loved to joke and kid around. Uh, and. And yet he, he was very professional, very hardworking, all hours of the day. When news would break, he was, he was willing to go. He loved to cover the news, especially the breaking news like uh, fires and, and police actions, that sort of thing. Uh, in 1978, there was a terrible blizzard. We were snowed in at the station for three days. And I'll never forget how bad Palmer looked and how bad I looked. And we got laughing about it because uh, we, we hated to go on the air, and yet people were depending on information. Um, but there was no place to shower, and we just had to exist for three days. But he was always able to keep his sense of humor about that stuff. And John has always kept his sense of humor about life and a positive outlook. I remember when John had open heart surgery. I never once heard him complain. I remember when John Palmer was diagnosed as having cancer. He never once complained. And you would never know some of the things that John Palmer's been dealt because he always has a positive outlook and really looks on the bright side of everything. And it's, I think it's one of the things that really makes him special. You've been at TV224 years now? Is that right? 24 years is coming July the 1st. Needless to say, you've been through some ups and some downs at the station. That's uh, true. Take us through the years and, and maybe talk about some of the people that you've worked with on down the line and the changes that you've seen over the years at TV2. Well, of course, when I first came to uh, Channel 2 Television, we had one photographer, and uh, he would shoot the commercials, and he also did the news story. So if we would have a bad accident, say, someplace on I-70 or whatever, we would take a Polaroid camera and go out, and we'd take pictures with a Polaroid camera. And if the photographer was not shooting a commercial on occasion, he would get there normally late. And uh, we really didn't have any of the network services that we do now. Everything was on film. And it's, uh, well, the change from the time I came uh, to Channel 2 and the time that I'm leaving, it's been the difference between night and day. Um, I pointed out uh, when I was asked, you know, if I probably would miss anything at Channel 2 television. There was one thing that uh, I had always had in the back of my mind as I grew older and you young people were coming along. I would like to be the field reporter on a live eye. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, that's on down the road. And, uh, and I just made up my mind that 
I've seen all the changes. We've basically gone to relatively high tech. Channel 2 is slowly but surely with our new ownership coming, you know, becoming a modern station. It's still on down the roadways. But it, um, there's been just a tremendous change that uh, uh, when we went from, uh, I recall Tony Holman, uh, the late Tony Holman, was in the uh, Jack Gilder's office, our general manager's office, mm -hmm. when they delivered the color cameras for the studio to Channel 2. And Tony never said a word. He knew that those were color cameras that they were setting up in our studios. Uh, Mark and I rehearsed for about three days with see what kind of clothes we could wear and everything like that, makeup. And when the changeover came, we did it on a Sunday. Mark and I normally didn't work Sunday, but we went in and we did the uh, six and the late news, color cameras, and we'd had a big full page spread in the newspaper. The very next day, Tony called a major meeting of staff at Channel 10. They flew an airplane someplace to pick up color cameras, and I think within a week or 10 days, Channel 10 was also <laughs> color. So um, that was part of the interesting part. One of the things that uh, I liked about Tony Holman, Tony Holman always smoked my cigarettes, I think, in the last couple of years of his life. Um, the doctors had told him that, Tony, don't smoke. And Tony, don't smoke. And he never carried a cigarette. If I happened to be around him, we did not socialize, except on a normally racing uh, occasions where they'd have a dinner or something like that, something going on in the city of Terre Haute, I would happen to be there. And uh, I'd be smoking, of course, and Tony would come up to me, I have a cigarette. And so I'd give him a cigarette. And I think that was probably one of the few times in the last few years of his life that he actually smoked a cigarette if I happened to be around. It could have happened on other occasions, <laughs> but uh, um, I, know, I do know that uh, um, probably the last two years, every time I would see Tony, he would ask me for a cigarette very gentlemanly. Speaking of cigarettes, I know one of the big stories since you've been at TV2 was when you had your own heart problems. A right. lot of people remember that period. Uh, tell us how that experience was for you and how that might have changed your life. Well, I, I suppose it did change my lifestyle in some ways. The way that all came about, it was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Of course, I was asleep, got a telephone call. There had been a shooting up on the north side of town, and we'd had a tremendous snowstorm that night. And I was backing, I had a company car, and I was backing it out of the driveway, and I got stuck in a snowdrift. And uh, so I dug my way out, and I noticed as I was digging out that, well, I pulled my sternum loose. I have really sprained something up in here. Uh, I went up, and I shot the shooting, came back, went to work the next day, and I still had this tightness. So I decided, well, I really ripped something loose because it, that doesn't feel good. So I went in for an examination, and. Uh, the late Dr. Krebel, Jack Krebel, um, they put me on the treadmill. I was on it about 30 seconds, and they took me off. And I'd been on the treadmill just about, oh, four or five months before that, had gone 11 minutes. And I, I'd never had a heart attack. And I guess that's one of the things that saved me. And Jack told me, he said, you know, you've got a problem. And um, why don't you drive over to Indianapolis, since uh, it's relatively early in the day, and uh, let them run a test on you. Well, they did a cath on me. And uh, 12 hours later, I was on the operating table and had a triple bypass and um, lost 50 pounds. I went from 199 pounds to uh, 150 pounds in that short period of time. I was back to work in 22 days. And of course, we came along with the quit smoking with Johnny. Right. I quit for two years. And had I not been at a poker game and was having a cool one, uh, in a smoke-filled room, and the gentleman next to me had a package of cigarettes there, and I said, give me a cigarette, and they said, no, you don't smoke, and I said, I do now, and um, I've smoked ever since. It's all going to change. I, oh, really? have, set, I have set a target date, and um, I think it's about time, you know, I'm no young man, and cigarettes will put you in an early grave, and I would like to at least live out my life expectancy, so um, I have an idea. I'm, I won't tell anyone because I, how come you're still smoking? You said you were going to quit on Tuesday or you were going to quit on Sunday. And I don't quit. I stop. I'm not a quitter. Uh, I've had two bouts with cancer and uh, knock on wood, uh, have recovered. Uh, I've had open heart surgery. And uh, Terre Haute has provided some pretty good medical care for me and the good Lord has looked after me. And so um, I've pushed it pretty hard. And I think that uh, I have a grandson now Right. And I think it's a good time maybe I ought to, you know, maybe change my lifestyle just a little bit. I'm not going to become Mr. Goody Goody. And I, there's nothing that I, I like everyone. Some people a hell of a lot better than I do others. 
There's nothing that I dislike more than a person that's a reformed drinker or a reformed smoker. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, I'll never take another drink or that I'll never smoke another cigarette, but uh, I'm going to stop for a while and see how things go and hopefully we'll, I'm in relatively good health for my age and uh, why push your luck? What I remember most about John is the friendship that he showed me when I first came to Terre Haute. As a young reporter, going into a newsroom can be a very scary experience. But John was an instant friend, an instant mentor. And I'm happy to say that through the years, John has really remained that way. We've had long lunches and good talks, and I hope that those long lunches and talks continue. He's really showed me his wisdom about the business and also about life, and I'll always remember him for that. Thanks, John. I'd just like to say uh, good luck to you, John. I recall that uh, uh, there were a couple of things uh, that I remember about you working with you so many years ago at Channel 2. One was when my first daughter, Sarah, was born back in 1972. You just went on and on and on. Uh, maybe mentioned it three or four straight days on the news, and. Uh, certainly endeared yourself to uh, my family as well as me and you always were so cordial to uh, to my family uh, really there's so many memories about you that I, I couldn't pick one out that we could probably put on here but uh, you certainly have been a tremendously uh, good friend of mine over the years and uh, certainly taught me a lot in the business when I was on the air and uh, all of the personalities that I recall in Terre Haute uh, Harry Fry and Dave Kirk and Valerie Jones and and uh, you'd have to call them all the Hall of Fame. You're certainly at the top of the list. Uh, it's just not going to be the same without you. There's no doubt about that. And I would like to uh, wish you and Alice and your family the very best. And I hope you have a, a great retirement. Let's talk uh, about news some more for a minute. I'm going to test your memory now. All right. We can go back even into radio if you would like. What are some of the big stories that, that stick out in your mind, if you want to name four or five, uh, whether they be in radio or in television through the years, or stories that you've enjoyed reporting? That I enjoyed reporting? Or that have been interesting for you to work on? Probably the biggest shocker that I ever had, and I was in radio at the time, um, right on top of what we call a console in radio, where you spin the records and all the dials and controls are. We had a little box there that had a red light on it, and that was our hookup to NBC News. And uh, the red light came on, and I flipped the switch up to hear on the headset, you know, what was going on. They said, the president has just been shot. And it didn't, really didn't register with me at the time, you know, uh, there's got to be a mistake here. And uh, so I kept listening, and they said, we're going to switch you to Dallas in 30 seconds. The countdown will get underway at the 10-second mark. The president has been shot, special bulletin. And uh, I couldn't even intro the fact that we were going to NBC. I just faded the record down and hit NBC News. That was probably the biggest shocker that I ever had uh, in all the time that I was in radio and in television. There's been a lot of good news stories. Um, I think uh, probably uh, industrial expansion in Terre Haute because that means jobs. And of course, you know, uh, I guess that's uh, kind of a narrow cited way to look at it uh, because that meant my job was more secure if the economy is good in the community. Uh, it always seemed like the, the stories that really stand out in your mind uh, are the bad news stories. Uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King, probably uh, because it's fresh in my mind, the, uh, the war in the Persian Gulf really stands out as one of the big stories in, in my career. There have been so many I would probably have to go back through my scrapbook that uh, Persian Gulf War because it's so fresh in my memory and the good news part of it is that it was over so quickly and even though you even lose one trooper in combat that's one too many uh, relatively speaking uh, you know it, it was a, if there is such a thing as a good war it was a good war when you're looking to buy or build a new home you want to do business Johnny from 1973 until 1978 while I was the weeknight weatherman at Channel 2 I just started in television back in those days, and Johnny, you taught me a lot. More importantly, I remember you were always understanding, always very supportive, and always had a good word. When I look back upon it, if it hadn't have been for you, the first job I had in television might not have gone so well, and I might not have decided to stay in television. I remember how hard you worked for the story. 
At 3 o'clock in the morning, if there was a big fire, more often than not, you'd be there with your wind-up film camera, and the next night, we'd see pictures of that late-night fire on Eyewitness News. It seemed like you were a one-man news department at times. And then who can forget the big blizzard of January 1978? You remember when we were all stranded at the station because of five-foot drifts over US-41? We didn't even have a change of clothes. What did you ever do with those socks, anyway? I'll miss you, Johnny, at those August meetings for the Muscular Dystrophy Telethon out in Las Vegas. It was always good to see you every year. I know how much that telethon and that cause is meant to you and how much you've given over the years to that cause. You got me started in the telethon, and I'm still a part of it here in the Nashville area every Labor Day. Television just won't be quite the same in the Wabash Valley without Johnny Palmer. It's the end of an era. But I know, Johnny, that for you and Alice, it's also a new beginning. And Cindy and I wish you nothing but good health and great happiness. While I worked at Channel 2, there was one question that I must have been asked a thousand times. Is Johnny Palmer really as nice as he appears on television? Yes, Johnny is as nice as he appears. That's the real Johnny Palmer that you've been inviting into your living rooms all these years. Good luck to you, Johnny, and God bless. We'll miss you. Um, another big part of your career over all these many years at TV2 has been the, the Jerry Lewis Muscular Dystrophy Telethon. Uh, that's really <coughs> become a big part of your life. That's true. I have, I don't know why Jerry does the Jerry Lewis Telethon. There, there's got to be something that has motivated him to do that for all these years. Uh, I have lost two good friends uh, to muscular dystrophy. And uh, one was kind of a fishing buddy of mine, a great White Sox fan that ought to register with you. And he, he was such a brilliant young man, and he died so early in life because of muscular dystrophy. And if there's, in fact, I was talking with our station management, I had, they said, you know, would you like to do a little work as a, maybe a, our political analyst or something like that? And um, that would be like jumping out of the frying, that would be like, uh, the, one of the rumors going around that Marla Keller and Johnny Palmer are going to be the new co-anchors at Channel 38. That's like jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. That's not true? No, that's not true. Okay. No, no, we've settled that rumor <laughs> right here and now. And I'm not going into radio. Um, I will go back for the Jerry Lewis Telethon. If they'd like for me to come back and work with you or, you know, and all the people down there during the telethon, I'd be more than happy to come down and put in my time cost-free to the station. You can't beat that. Well, it is amazing to sit and watch you go through that. This year, this past year, 1991, was the I first I think this was my 21st year uh, doing the Jerry Lewis Telethon. In fact, um, I think there are only three other uh, hosts or co-hosts of the Jerry Lewis Telethon that have been doing it uh, for more than 21 years. And every year that I would go back out there, uh, I didn't attend all the meetings. Uh, but I went to the, what I considered the key meetings, and when I would come back, um, I don't know how you get hyped up to, um, you know, do a show like that, but boy, when I came back here, I was ready to do it. I could have done it the next day, and uh, the company was good to me. They didn't make me work the full 21 and a half hours or whatever it was. I guess they thought maybe Palmer needs a little bit of rest. <laughs> I could have done the full 21 hours uh, without any problem. Um, and I'd go back and do it again this year, uh, you know, without without hesitation. If they invite me to come down and say, you want to come down for an hour when we kick the show off and come down and stand in the last hour of the telethon, I'll be there with bells on. The only thing I refuse to do is I don't want to wear a tux. I want to come down as Johnny Palmer. Let's see, Johnny Palmer is intelligent, witty, handsome, and a great personality uh, on air. Johnny, did I say enough for my five dollars? Ah, just kidding. Well, you know this tribute wouldn't be the same without a little bit of humor because that's definitely something that Johnny has. He always had a way of walking into the room and even if I was in a blah mood, boy, he could just put a smile on my face. And when I first heard that he was retiring, the first thing I thought of was the telephone. It won't be the same. Johnny has worked with the telephone, as many of you know, for about 20 years. And um, not only did he do a great job professionally, but he was also very sincere in what he did. He not only put his body through all these grueling hours, but he also put his heart and his soul into it. 
and for all the MDA patients out there, we tip our hat off to you. We love you. We thank you. And on a more personal side, I'm going to miss you, and I think the world of you, and good luck in whatever you do. Bye. Let's get a little personal now. Um, you were talking about Alice earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, how has she put up with you all these years? Well, boy, with great <laughs> difficulty, I, I can say that. I don't know. Um, it seemed like it was from one extreme to the other. Uh, when I would have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to do a morning radio show, uh, I would go to bed, for the most part, uh, r relatively early. And then, of course, when I made the transition to television, it's yuck, yuck, rough on a young couple. Um, I think that's why I probably see many divorces in, mm -hmm. in television among young people because you work nights and your wife is at home and it makes for a difficult home life. Um, maybe because Alice and I were both a little bit older um, and uh, we had done a lot of our running around done. We had our little one and uh, Alice was always a, a good homemaker and I guess she just thought, well, I'm not going to change Johnny Palmer, so why try? I married him, so, you know, I'll take the good with the bad. And, uh, she, boy, she'd been an excellent companion. She's gone through thick and thin with me. And uh, very seldom. Oh, she's complained, but very seldom. At any rate, your daughter Sherry, certainly the apple of her father's eye, and she's moved away now. That's yeah, she's, uh, living in Cal lonely. she's living in California. She ma married an attorney who is a captain in the Air Force, uh, Tom Hicks. And his father is an attorney, Tim Hicks, is who she married. His father is Tom Hicks, who is an attorney down in Sullivan. And um, on December the 31st, a little bit after midnight, why we got uh, a little boy, um, let's see, it's Jonathan, named after Johnny Palmer, Thomas, who is named after Grandpa Hicks, uh, Jonathan Thomas Hicks. And uh, probably, I don't know when you're going to run this show, but uh, they're going to be back here in June, will be my first opportunity to, to see the little one. I'll spoil him rotten. Let's move on to your other children, so to speak. Uh, well, one right sitting next to you here, Slugger. This is uh, my number one boy. This is Slugger. He's my old, old Basset Hound, and he's encountering his second go-round with cancer, and he's undergoing uh, chemotherapy treatments right now. Then I've got the big, heavy dog. That's uh, Molly. She's our little female Basset. And uh, then, of course, I have a third one, and that's Sherry's dog, Gussie. Uh -huh. So I have a house full of puppy dogs, needless to say, and I love them all. Speaking of love, uh, people have heard you talk a lot on the air about Montana. I know you've got a place out there right. that you visit quite frequently. What's the attraction for you? I know you're from out west, so right. to speak. Uh, what do you like about it out there? Uh, well, the country is pristine. It's just like it was years and years ago. In fact, um, I know the first time I was out there with my father, and this is right after I came out of the military, and um, the gentleman that uh, owns the property adjacent said that uh, when we would go for a walk, we were probably walking for the first time on part of the country, and he said in other parts probably where the Indians before us walked. But, but uh, Terre Haute is home. Montana, far enough north where you get <laughs> Quite a bit of snow up there. I oh, know folks I are love it. talking about John. Are you sure you want to get into this? Is that the truth? People want to know. Is that I the truth? I, I love it. Of course, you know, when I was a young man growing up, uh, snow and cold weather were just part of everyday life. And uh, I love snow. John, I wanted to say thank you for the influence you have been on me and all of the help that you have given me through the years. Um, definitely a big influence on a lot of people that have come and gone from here at TV2. You're truly going to be missed. You've done a lot for this business. And um, I just have to say that after six years of working with you, I was never able to figure you out. And I'm sure your wife, Alice, would say the same thing. You're a one of a kind, John. And I guess probably the biggest thing I'm going to miss is being able to kid you about the cold, snowy winter. I don't know very many people around the station here who like winter weather, but there is one saying that I will always remember, and uh, I'm going to miss hearing that from you, John. That was 20 inches of snow and 20 below. Well, John, I tell you what, I hate winter. I really do. But one of these days, I hope we get 20 inches of snow and 20 below, because you deserve it, buddy. For myself and all of the past and present employees here at TV2 and all of the viewers all across the Wabash Valley and all of the counties that TV2 broadcasts to, you are truly going to be missed. We say God bless you. 
good luck, and enjoy your retirement from broadcasting. The city of Terre Haute congratulates Johnny Palmer on the occasion of his retirement from WTWO-TV, climaxing a radio and television career spanning 40 years. Long time, John. <laughs> John's years in Terre Haute broadcasting began in WBOW Radio in 1957, with 1968 the beginning of his TV years at W2, first as sports announcer, then as news anchor. John's nightly TV newscast has made his the most familiar face and voice on Terre Haute television. His many followers will miss him, and we join with them in best wishes for success and pleasure in all future endeavors. Signed, Pete P. Chalice. Oh, I thank you. Thank you, Harry. Dear Mr. Palmer, someone that doesn't know you very close, of course, I am delighted to join with your family and friends in congratulating you on your retirement from WTWO-TV in Terre Haute after 23 years as their news anchor. Your long and distinguished career in broadcasting has been characterized by loyalty and a keen dedication to the first-rate communications. For four decades, God, that's a long time, <laughs> the broadcasting community and the citizens of Wabash Valley have benefited from your many contra contributions, your expertise and professionalism have earned you the lasting respect of your colleagues, and I now know that you will be greatly missed. Barbara joins me in sending best wishes for every future happiness. Sincerely, George Bush. Oh. Thank you, sir. Whereas the greatness of the sons of Indiana derives in part from qualities possessed by the noble chieftains of the Indian tribes which once roamed its domain, and whereas it has been the immemorial, immemorial custom of the state of Indiana to attract to its support those who have exhibited such qualities, and whereas there has endeared himself to the citizens of Indiana, one Johnny Palmer, distinguished by his humanity in living, his loyalty and friendship, his wisdom and counsel, and his inspiration and leadership. Now, therefore, Recognizing his greatness and desiring to avail myself of his counsel, I do hereby appoint him a chieftain upon my staff with the rank and title of Sagamore the Wabash, and signed Governor Evan By. Oh, thank you. Thank you. When I think about John Palmer, I think back to the very first day that I walked in here to TV2 as an official employee. I was sitting with Dennis Campbell at the sports desk going over a few things. I started out in weekend sports, and Johnny Palmer was there, and I was in awe, to be quite frank about it. It seems rather silly to me now, and I do not mean any disrespect whatsoever in saying that. It's just that I grew up watching John on television over all these years, and when I finally got here to the newsroom and saw Johnny Palmer sitting there, well, I was wide-eyed to say the least, but when I say that it amuses me now that I was in awe of Johnny, what I mean is that of anyone, you would think maybe Johnny Palmer would have been the guy to have the big ego, uh, maybe looking down on some of the new people who came into the building, but in fact, the opposite was true. John always took time to help people out, not just myself, but any young person who came in through the doors at TV2 and any success that I may have had to this point. I can certainly owe a lot of that to the help of Johnny Palmer. Uh, John, I might be retiring with you now if I had gotten a penny for every time someone asked me a question about you when we've been out around the Wabash Valley covering stories. They want to know, is Johnny Palmer, what is he really like? Is he like what we see on TV? Is he really that ornery? Well, yes, he is. What you see is what you get when it comes to Johnny Palmer. What about the toupee? Does Johnny wear a toupee? I told him the truth. I said, yes, he's got three, one that looks like he needs a haircut, a regular one, and one that looks like he just had a haircut. But in all seriousness, John, thanks a lot for all of your help. Uh, it's been rather strange around here since you left. I will admit I was one of those who was quite shocked when you came in and said that you were, in fact, retiring. I believe you now. We miss you, and we wish you and Alice the best of luck in the future. As I said on the air the other night, um, I will miss the job, I'll miss the people. And I, sh I should have qualified that because um, I won't miss the job, and yet I will miss the job. Deep down inside me, I will, I will miss the job. Um, I'll miss the people. I always recall what a gentleman once told me, and I've heard it re you know, repeated on numerous occasions, that, uh, you know, who do you thank for your paycheck? Well, most people would say, Tim Gilbert, you know, he's your general manager. He's the guy that signs your paycheck. Well, Tim Gilbert does sign the paycheck, but the people that you really want to thank are our viewers out there. And, uh, oh, I'll tremendously miss the people I work with, you know. Those that are, you know, come and gone, I'll miss them. 
some are still in Terre Haute, and uh, you know, we socialize a little bit, not too much, but uh, I'll miss all the people I work with. Even our production people, I'll miss them. <laughs> our engineers, you know, that I tangle with every day. Um, the news people, I don't think that I've ever truly met having a crossword with any of them, and I don't think if they've ever zinged me a little bit that they truly meant it, you know, they probably had a right to say something, you know, that Palmer didn't do this or Palmer has done that. But um, I don't think that there has ever been truly a crossword among all the people on the staff and myself. So um, I'll miss them. And I'll go back down every now and then just, uh, you know, to touch base with them to make sure that they're behaving themselves and doing a good job. Well, speaking on behalf of everyone down at TV2, the new staffers and everyone else, it's been a hell of an experience working with you. And it's going to seem very strange to be down at that station if you're not down there. So you better come back and see us. And we certainly wish you all the best in uh, your post-broadcast years. Hopefully it'll be many, many years to come. I appreciate that. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. A tribute to Johnny Palmer has been brought to you by Terre Haute First National Bank, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Regional Hospital, and Complete Outdoor Equipment.